Hello and welcome to the second episode of Consequentially Speaking, a series created and hosted by the Chelsea-based mental health and wellness organisation, The SOAP. Now, our aim is to shed light on communication on a host of everyday relationships. Uh, those of you who were with us for the first episode will notice this time. We're in separate spaces and that is, of course, due to the lockdown regulations. Hopefully this won't take away from the quality of the discussion. Uh, the particularly astute among you will notice that I'm not Simon Brook who moderated the first discussion. Um, unfortunately, Simon was called away for a family commitment, so you have me instead. Uh, my name is Gail. In our last webinar, we looked at how couples interacted, the communication, sometimes miscommunication between couples, and how by paying attention to how we speak, at least turn those arguments into something with constructive results. Today, we're going to be looking at how parents and teenagers communicate, um, or in some cases, of course, they don't, and the problems that that can create, both for uh, parents and for the teenagers themselves. Once again, we have two members of the SOAPS clinical board with us. Uh, we have the head of family therapy, Dr. Shadi Shanavaz, and the head of wellbeing, Holly Rubin. Uh, welcome to you both. Uh, both are seasoned professionals on the topic we're going to discuss, and both are parents as well. We're going to start by watching a scene that typifies many an interaction between parent and child. And then we're going to turn to our experts from SOAP, Holly and Shadi, to get their take on what we've just seen and how they think things could perhaps be done differently. Um, we would very much like you, the audience, to take part in this. So you can do this via the chat box on YouTube. So simply type in your thoughts, your comments, questions, anything that you want to say, and we'll have our team respond to them. Uh, we know we also have some teenagers tuning in today. A big welcome to you guys. We'd very much like to hear your perspective on this, so please don't hold back on that. So over now to our father and daughter scene. What? Why didn't you pick up? What are you doing? Why are you FaceTiming me? Because I'm sick of shouting up the stairs to you. Right. So what are you doing? Nothing. Okay, what sort of nothing? Just nothing. Uh, okay, um, look, how were live lessons? Did you, did you do them all? Fine. And when you say fine, you mean... Oh, Dad, what do you want? Just seeing how you are, that's all. Checking up on me, you mean? No, I'm just seeing if you're all right and if you want anything. Not really. Hot chocolate? Yeah, you can get that yourself, I'm not your servant. I mean, do you need any help with any work? I'm doing algebraic fractions, back to rising quadratics. Ah, well, I'm sure I could, you know, help out somewhere if, if you want me to. It's fine, I can always speak to Erin. Yeah, we'll make sure you do. I will, stop hassling me. Are you coming down for dinner? Maybe. Okay, uh, well, let's see if we can turn that maybe into a yes by the evening. Is there anything else? If everything's all right. Okay. So, so is it? What? All right. Yes. Because look, if there's anything wrong, you know you can just say- and... I'm fine. All right, fine, good, great. Just, you know, if, it, if it's not, it's, it's, it's all right to say so. Dad, please. I'm not about to commit suicide and I'm not puking all my food into the toilet. Will that do? Ah, uh, all right. There's no need to be like that, is it? I'm just concerned, that's all. Well, don't be. Can I meet my friends on Saturday? You know you can't. We'll be meeting outside and we'll be socially distanced. Please, I haven't seen them since before Christmas. Well, look, I'm not sure you should have seen them then either. But you let me go then, so what's different? You know the rules are getting tighter all the time. But we'll be really careful. All my other friends are allowed to go out. Their parents trust them to be sensible. 
<laughs> really, best not to put it in those terms after we found that vape in your bedroom. I told you that it wasn't mine. I was holding it for a friend. Do you even know how ridiculous that sounds? Why can't you just let me see my friends? It's really important to me. Yeah, so he's not killing everyone by sharing the virus. Bit dramatic. Oh, really? Is it? Thousands of people dying a day and you think it's a bit dramatic? The problem is you and your friends don't really care about anyone else, do you? And I don't think you realise how lucky you are. There's tens of thousands of people who've died from the virus, hundreds of thousands who've lost their incomes, and you and your friends want to meet up in the park and break the rules. Dad! But you all seem to exist in this privileged little world, oblivious to what's really going on in it. Being locked up here isn't a privilege, it's a torture, while I'd rather endure alone. Look, I'm just trying to make you see the problems of... <sighs> Great. OK, well, as you can see there, a, a typical conversation, no doubt, in many homes during the lockdown between teenagers and their parents and quite painful to actually watch. It seemed to be a one sided conversation, too. Um, Tom, let's go to you first. What do you think was going on uh, during that interaction? Um, I don't know. It's a sort of I have to, it's a. Um... It's a fairly typical conversation that we have. We just seem to, to get into this cycle where I feel like I'm trying to sort of reach out and see if everything's all right and I, I seem to sort of get rebuffed or get very little back. Um, and, you know, and then we sort of end up, I guess, spiraling it a, a bit out of a bit out of anywhere that's useful. I'm aware of that. It's just sort of hard to get out of it, if you get a bit stuck. Yeah, it escalated, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Um, Hannah, what do you think? Well, I mean, he says, he asks if I'm all right, but it just feels like he's checking up on me. He's not actually asking if I'm okay. And, you know, he's FaceTiming me. It's like we don't really have a proper conversation. A FaceTime isn't really that important to me. And he's not really, I don't feel like he's trying to actually ask me if I'm okay, because I'm stressed about school, but he doesn't ask those sorts of questions. Okay, let's bring in our psychotherapist, um, Holly and Chardy. Um, shall I start, Holly? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think um, Hannah was spot on, because I do feel that, you know, FaceTiming um, your children is okay when they live abroad or in a different town or even across the town. But when they're in the same house, it just creates a lot of distance and it doesn't really invite the teenager to talk <clears throat> about what's going on and how they're feeling. And um, I think Hannah was very kind anyway because she, she did try to invite her dad to come upstairs into her room um, by asking for a hot chocolate. And uh, unfortunately, dad kind of missed that great opportunity to go upstairs and have a quick chat with um, with his daughter um, and he just kind of took it as an insult and said I'm not your servant so again that creates hostility um, just a bit of anger bitterness um, and that's just to start with but I'll let Holly say something too otherwise I could go on for ages. <laughs> I think it's so difficult for them both really is is as we watch that we see how painful it is because dad is trying to communicate he is trying to you know to find out how Hannah is and it's also really difficult to know I think from his end how to do that and so what we're what we're seeing is communication being really challenged here and perhaps that's a, a question to be able to ask you know how would how would you like to have these conversations when can we do so so mm. it's about opening things up I believe Absolutely. And, and, and what we don't know is, is why dad, because he's assuming that things aren't okay with Hannah. Um, so there's a worry there. So um, what we don't know is, is why he's worried and what he's seen, you know, um, that's kind of like the behind the scenes that we don't know about. And the fact that he is worried is actually really shows how he cares and how it's he endearing. Wants. Yeah. yeah. Chardy, a point you made uh, right away was um, something that one of our audience members has just sent in, uh, Harriet says, should dad and daughter reserve conversations for face-to-face -face rather than having them remotely? What do you think of that? 
Well, I think face-to-face <clears throat> -to -face conversations are quite difficult with teenagers in general. Um, so I wouldn't say that you sit down and you talk to each other face to face, but if you take a hot chocolate upstairs and Hannah's sitting at her desk and you sit on the bed and she kind of has her, her back almost to you so she's not seeing you face to face, I think the conversation's easier. I think Hannah could tell us more because she's the teenager, but often what I realize is that, um, you know, conversations that happen really, really helpful and maybe difficult conversations, they usually happen in the car, uh, when you're walking side by side, um, you know, when you're watching TV, so you're facing somewhere else. So I wouldn't recommend kind of like parents sitting down at the table and having a conversation face to face because that won't happen. Um, but, you know, taking a hot chocolate upstairs, as I said, and sit on the bed and just have a, a, a nice cozy time um, and wait for the teenager to, to kind of talk at his or her own pace would be more helpful than a FaceTime. And Hannah said something interesting afterwards. Hannah, you said you felt really stressed. You've got difficult maths uh, topics to do. Why did you not feel um, that you could actually say to dad, dad, I'm stressed, and I'll bring in uh, Shadi and Holly, why do teenagers feel they can't say stuff? But Hannah, why did, you, why did you feel you couldn't say, dad, you know what? These maths things are doing my head in. Um, well, I felt like he would you know he would start stressing out about me and I don't really want that to happen and you know I have friends I can talk to about maths but you know I don't really want to start pouring out all my feelings to him over a FaceTime or you know. Mm. Shadi and Holly do you, is that the kind of typical um, comment reaction you get when you are um, supporting teenagers and their families? I think it's so often the case that teenagers worry that they will worry their parents. And because of that, that keeps, keeps them silenced. And in fact, as soon as parents hear that, you know, it does give them a chance to reflect and to, to say, mm, you know, maybe I went about this the wrong way. Because in fact, parents very much want to hear those worries and it will not worry them. These are, you know, we are adults. And we, we manage these things differently, but that is difficult for, for the teenagers to know because inside them, it's stressing them. So it's such a good point, Hannah. Yeah, and, and a question from the audience from Jack, he says, is dad trying to address too many issues in one conversation? What do you think? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yes, I mean, to be fair, Hannah brings up the second issue uh, about friends and things so and and these are kind of hot issues that they probably talk about on a daily basis I'm guessing at different times of the day um so so yes there are a lot of issues coming up at the same time um but it, but again these are these are also issues that come up for for Hannah um so it's not just dad bringing them up uh, another question from the audience uh, from George is how do you as a parent determine whether there's a real problem rather than just frustration with the current situation. How do you tell that? Such a good point as well. When, you know, we often hear from parents and from adults, when do we get to worry? Because that's the question. When is this something that's, you know, uh, something small and innocuous or when do we get to really see that perhaps there's an underlying issue here? And that is a difficult answer, but it's something that comes with increased conversation so you're not going to gauge that at, off of one time especially if it's a FaceTime call right it's a we need to unpack that a little bit more together um, and find ways in which parent and child can have those conversations like Shadi was suggesting mm -hmm. yeah exactly and one of the uh, our, our audience has just uh, kind of confirmed that Sabrina says conversations usually happen informally you know rather than formally um, but in the kind of new world that we have now, where you're not necessarily driving your child somewhere to meet friends or to take them to the shops or to a football match or whatever, there aren't the same opportunities, are there, that there would have been before, you know, um, before the pandemic? Mm. There aren't. There aren't. Well, you, need, you can create opportunities. I mean, you know, I often say to a lot of parents, just try and go with your go with what your child wants to do. Like if they're very interested in a specific program that they want to watch, um, you know, show interest and sit down and watch it with them. 
and and often you can then start conversations kind of like um, during the show after the show just before um, you know do you want to just go out and grab um, you know an ice cream from somewhere um, that's open and, and you walk there and, and you walk back and, and you kind of create opportunities so I think you have to be use your imagination much more um, as a parent to kind of try and engage with it with it with the child and the teenager especially and as Holly was saying you have to create these conversations these kind of things happen over a period of time they're not you know no teenager is going to open up suddenly um, you know, uh, all of a sudden to, to a parent because they protect parents. That's what teenagers do. Um, you know, they, they care and, and they protect parents from their and, worries. Yeah, and I think to that point as well, it's important to, um, as Shadi was saying, to do things that they're engaged in. Now, it might very well not, you know, excite you to go and watch your kids gaming with their friends, but you find out a lot when you walk into the room and, and kids are doing that and you get to, you know, connect with some of their friends as well and just say a quick hello or walk in and walk out. I, I certainly not my favorite thing to do, but I, it is an opportunity for me to just say hi to my son's friends when they're playing as well. So those little opportunities um, almost go into this bank account of, of which you build connection and communication with your kids. Yeah. Uh, another question from Mary in the audience, um, and I guess it's a question a lot of parents will be asking because they won't know the answer to it, is what are the right sort of questions to ask or the signs to look out for to find out whether your child's moody behaviour is typical teenage behaviour or whether there is something deeper? Can you guide us on, on what to ask? Well, I would often say not to ask so many questions but more to try and um, name what's going on and what you think is going on for, for the teenager. Because we all know as parents that this is a horrible time for teenagers. You know, teenagers are supposed to be out with friends and they're supposed to spend very little time with parents um, and, and just kind of like a, a time to kind of um, recharge their batteries and then go out with friends again and go out to school and study and, you know, meet. They, they need to kind of be developing their identity and socially um, and their kind of sense of self with, with peers. And of course, they can't really do that at the moment because, you know, doing it on FaceTime isn't going to really <laughs> give them sense of self um, in that way. And also a lot of teenagers are saying that because they're not doing anything at the moment, they're actually not calling their friends because they're afraid of being boring. I don't know, Holly, if you've heard that. This is something I'm hearing recently, which I wasn't hearing in the first lockdown, but now, you know, lots of teenagers are saying to me, I actually don't, I avoid, um, you know, contacting my friends because I've got nothing to say and I don't want to come off as boring. So they're actually isolating themselves more and more. And as parents, I think if you can name some of those things, like, gosh, this is a really difficult time for you, you know, and for all teenagers and you must really miss your friends. And, you know, it's not normal for you to be with mommy and daddy the whole time. And it must be really frustrating. That opens up conversations rather than asking questions. Because I think asking questions is a bit woe well for, for, for a teenager. Yeah, and I think to, I think to head in, Shadi, with empathizing with that and you know, joining, joining your, your adolescents and saying, it, this is so difficult for you. This is not where you're supposed to be. We're not supposed to all be here together. I think a really big challenge at the moment is Teens are meant to be um, fighting up against those boundaries that are so exceptionally tight right now and not necessarily only imposed by their parents, right? Mm. These are legal, these are legal issues at the moment where we can't allow them to do certain things, not because we don't want to and we're being strict or we're being mean, but because we have those same rules imposed upon us. Now, as adults, we can navigate those and, and deal with them a little bit better than our teenagers can. But to be able to just sort of empathize with that and understand that, uh, that they do need to speak with their friends and they do need to have that opportunity. It might be driving us crazy because there's too much tech time and there's too much time online, but we have to remember that that's the only way that they are in fact socializing right now and they do need to continue to do that. Mm. And, and actually that's, that is an interesting point that you made, Holly, because does this mean that the boundaries you normally set around tech, so you might say, oh, you're only allowed so much time on your phone, blah, 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 blah. Um, does that mean that parents should be more relaxed now because that's the only way that they can communicate with their friends and the outside world? 
Ooh, I'm so loath to answer that question right now because I know my teenagers are going to be watching later. <laughs> and hold me to it. But, but I do think that we have to be a little bit more lenient as parents at the moment and understand that their devices are being used to connect with their friends and to socialize. And it, it, there's nothing stopping us as parents, you know, sneaking around their back and saying, who are you talking to? What are you doing? What are you looking at? Because I think inside our heads, we have this idea that they're constantly on Candy Crush or they're constantly on, you know, whatever games they're playing. And, and that stresses us. It worries us because it, we know it's not the best use of their time. And, you know, once we find out what they're doing online, they're often researching, they're, they're doing a lot for school as well. So we have to remember that it's um, to, to have a little bit of insight into that and, and to find out what their worlds actually consist of, I think would allay some of those worries. Don't you think, Shadi? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. I'll just take one more question from the audience and then we'll uh, go on to the second part of the scene, um, which talk more about lockdown and that where it's really escalated. But Georgia has, has written in here, um, interestingly, um, she says, would it be better to have schooling in a more communal area at home? Because a bit like you've just said, Holly, you can kind of a little bit of a sneak peek, see what they're actually doing you have uh, more informal visibility on what's going on. Um, and it might make them, I guess, if you have a couple of teenagers uh, uh, at home in the family, it might make them feel more of in, as though they're in a classroom situation. I mean, I often say to, to my teenagers, I say, you know, research has shown that actually if they study downstairs in the kitchen uh, where their mum's cooking and, and doing stuff, they actually are more productive and they can get up um, after about 40 minutes of studying, they can get up, uh, you know, take something from the fridge, sit back down again, and just having movement around them, which is why a lot of teenagers love to go to cafes, you know, um, and study because they like the hub. And, you know, in my days, they told us to study um, in silence. Um, and now, you know, now we know that it, it's not very helpful because it creates quite a lot of anxiety in children to be studying in silence. So they listen to music, they have, you know, so, so that helps, but unfortunately these days it's a bit difficult because you've got, you know, people on Zoom and people doing calls. So you've got mum working, you've got dad working, you've got the other siblings on. So actually they don't have enough peace and quiet to be able to do their work in a communal space. And that's, so they have to be upstairs in their rooms to have some kind of, you know, to be able to concentrate is, is, is my experience. Yes, I think that that's all really true. And I also think that let's, when thinking of different styles and different children and adolescents and the way that they learn, uh, I think that's really important as well because for some that distraction is overwhelming and that, mm. that having that hustle and bustle doesn't necessarily work for all kinds of kids. So I think we have to think about that as well too. Yeah. Lovely. Let's uh, ask Tom and Hannah to go back to the scene now, but can we have a couple of pointers from you both to see if there's some things they can say or the tone of the voice or or what could dad say what could uh what could hannah say that might make that scene go a bit better a couple of pointers from you and then we'll go to the scene well i think you know uh, if dad agrees to take a hot chocolate upstairs to um to his daughter <laughs> and say right coming up straight away don't worry i'll be upstairs in a minute and uh, take up the hot chocolate and, and sit down on the bed and, you know, and, and just have a quick chat, that's all. Or not sit down on the bed and just give her a kiss on the forehead or the head or something and, and see how that creates um, more of a nice context. Yeah, I don't know. kind of just open things up, you know, right then and there, having that hot chocolate, having dad done something that she requested um, instead of a no, I think everybody's so used to hearing no right now. That's a, that's an easy yes. So if we can give that, that would be, uh, that would be nice. Or you don't even have to say you're doing it, but you can surprise her with it too. That's also something very nice to know. To be able okay. To. That's brilliant. So audience at home, we'd like you to take part in this. Um, what we'd like you to do is while Tom and Hannah play the scene is we'd like you to, uh, type the word stop if you feel that the situation is spiraling out of control again, and of course give us some suggestions as to how they can get back on track. But just type stop, we'll stop the scene, we'll get Tom and Hannah to replay 
and uh, we'll see how we go. But uh, Tom and Hannah, if you can take on board the suggestions from Holly and uh, Shardy, and off you go. What? Why didn't you pick up? What are you doing? Why are you FaceTiming me? Because I'm sick of shouting up the stairs to you. Right. So what are you doing? Nothing. What sort of nothing? Just nothing. All right, so how were life lessons? Did you do them all? Fine. Okay, and when you say fine, you mean... Dad, what do you want? I'm just seeing how you are. Checking up on me, you mean? No, I, I'm just... Okay, we just, sorry, guys, we've just had to stop there from the audience. It did feel as though it was starting to go down a slightly more rocky uh, road at that point. Um, Holly and Shadi, thoughts, please. Yeah, I think <clears throat> when she says, um, why are you FaceTiming me? And dad says, because I'm sick and, of, of shouting upstairs to you. I think he could do something a bit different and say, oh, um, you know, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it bothered you or something. Um, I just wanted to see if you're all right, sweetie. You know, just just a, a one down position would probably be a bit better than to say it I'm sick of- to disturb you, right? Yeah, sorry to disturb you, yeah. Okay, so, sorry, I dropped my book. <laughs> so, uh, Tom, could you take that on board and restart the scene again? Please. And in fact, the um, the comment from uh, uh, the audience here with the stop is it was an unhelpful opening. They felt that the beginning had started badly and uh, kind of disintegrated from from then on. So if you can replay, please. Sure. <clears throat> what? Oh, hi, listen, I'm sorry to sorry, didn't want to sort of interrupt you. Uh, school work and everything, so I just thought I'd give you a quick call, just um, check in, see if everything's all right with you, sweetie. Um, yeah, I'm all right. Good. Um, uh, do you need anything from me at all? Um, not really. Um, a hot chocolate, maybe. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm uh, sort of hot chocolate out and get some meat together. Um, how how do you want it? Um. Just sort of with a bit of milk and um, do you have any marshmallows? <laughs> See what I can do. Okay, uh, thank you. Can we school work today? How's um, the yeah, they were all right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like you're on top of it all? Um, yeah, I guess. Um, I had a lot of work today, though, but I, I basically finished all of it. So. All right. Because if you're not, I mean, you know, just say, I'm sure I'll be able to help out. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll be all right. I can always, you know, ask one of my friends. All right. Do you think you're going to come down to dinner today? Um, yeah, maybe. All right. When you say maybe, can we make that a definite yes? I'll think about it. All right, and would just be nice if you put in an appearance, you know, that's all. Okay. Okay, stop there from the audience. Um, just to say, we had a comment, and Tom, you included this in, uh, in, in the scene. Comment before was more affection needed in your voice, and it certainly came across. Holly, uh, Shadi, do you think that that helped with the opening there? It, it certainly did help and you could see that Hannah was smiling and much more engaged in the conversation. She was warmer, um, but then that kind of affection faded away as, um, as the conversation <laughs> went on, I'm afraid, where dad was rolling his eyes and getting a bit irritated when she asked for marshmallows. So I think the, the, the kind of, um, and as soon as that went away, Hannah, then you could see was much more distant and much less available. So when he asked about the dinner, she wasn't really going to consider dinner at that point. Um, so you can see how as soon as dad becomes a bit distant and a bit less empathic, um, Hannah becomes more distant as well. And, and I wonder whether <clears throat> that might be reserved for once you've gone up and brought the hot chocolate to be able to say, 
so great to see you now. Will you come down for dinner? It'd be really great if we can have dinner all together. So, mm -hmm. you know, so you don't have to say it all in one go, but I do, I do empathize as well with that in that, you know, it sounds like there's not a lot of communication going on. So you can sort of feel he wants to get in all of his answers in one, in one shot too. So, but you can break it up. You can take time to, to get to those other bits as well. In the first interaction, Tom uh, said to her, when she asked for a hot chocolate, he said to her, I'm not your servant. Um, <laughs> Shadi, Holly, do parents sometimes feel that uh, when they're asked to do things by, by their teenagers? And if so, why? Well, I mean, I think they do. I think teenagers are quite demanding. <laughs> Um, and it goes on for, um, you know, I have adult children and uh, they continue to be demanding. Um, and, I, and I think it's great because I think it shows that they, 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 they trust you and they want to connect with you. I think it's their way of asking for connection in a way. Sometimes they do kind of, you know, um, exaggerate a bit. Um, but what you need to remember is that, you know, teenagers are um, almost adult, but very much child. Um, so they still need uh, to be cared for they still need so when they ask for a hot chocolate it's more like you know show me some care show me that you're holding me in mind show me that um you know I can still ask you to do things for me and I think that's that's a nice thing I think if teenagers stop asking parents for things there's a real danger there I'd be worried mm -hmm. yeah. it seemed to be fine didn't it until she asked for until she asked for marshmallows and he rolled his eyes at that point didn't he mm -hmm. A little too, a little too far for him on that one. But, uh, but, but the request is, I, I agree with you, Shadi, the request is important. It's, it is Hannah's way of asking to connect as well. She gets mm. to see him face to face. She wasn't so happy that he FaceTimed her. So this way, Hannah's also getting that in contact um, person to person as well. Yeah. A uh, question from the audience here, suggestion from the audience, I should say. Uh, uh, audience member Jane says, could Tom switch the do you question to a how can I help you question? Um, so it's more open. What do you think about that? Yeah. Open-ended questions are, are very good. Um, that really does help the teenager just respond the way that they want to so that they, they don't feel too confined and too directed into a response. I think that that would be a really good change. Yeah, and James, who's just typed in here, so uh, take going on from that. So how do you persuade your teenager to engage in conversation when they've no interest in you or the topic? Um, and that can often lead to conflict, can't it? Mm -hmm. mm. But again, you have to look at what's led up to that kind of non-interest, you know, um, and try to repair that. I mean, I think there is a lot of repairing that needs to be done with, with um, parents and teenagers, I think, you know, when parents get it wrong, they get irritated um, and they might say something, you know, shout something or say something like, I'm not your servant and then kind of think about it afterwards. And I, I think it's okay, it's, it, it's not okay. I think it's essential to then, if you do do something like that, to go upstairs, take the hot chocolate and say, gosh, I'm really sorry. I was really in a bad mood, you know, before. And, I, you know, I shouldn't have said what I said. And, um, you know, I'm sorry. And that goes a long way. Um, you know, to, to help the relationship between the teenager and the parent repairing things that we do wrong, because we all do wrong things wrong as parents, you know, lots of times. Um, so, but repairing is really important. And I think taking, taking all of these incidents or this one specifically in, in, in a vacuum, that's not what's happening, right? Hannah's had a huge day. She's had interactions with teachers, positive, negative, we don't know, with friends, missing friends. So all of these things are happening in her own world, which you're not a part of. And this is true all the time, whether it's COVID or non-COVID, right? Mm. Our teens have lives of their own and we're trying to have a little bit of window into that. Um, so I guess to the point, how do you get more uh, um, accessibility? Mm -hmm. uh, David has written in here, he says, there seems to be a lot of parents apologizing going on. Um, don't teenagers also need to take responsibility? Aren't we in danger of spoiling the kids? Well, you'd be surprised how quickly teenagers apologize when they, when they see their parents doing it. Um, I think, you know, for me, I've seen it in my sessions with um, the family sessions. And as soon as the parent 
puts a step forward and says something, the teenager immediately comes back with 50 times more, actually. So, um, you know, teenagers learn from what they see as well. Um, and it's no good saying to them, you know, you need to apologize if the parent never apologizes for what they do. But if the parent shows by example, the teenager learns. It's a big learning thing for teenagers to think that, okay, it's okay to make mistakes as long as we apologize afterwards. So I don't think you can spoil teenagers by um, giving them love and care um, and respect. And in addition to that, I think there is a reality whilst it's not about um, not recognizing that they, they need to do certain things. Of course they do. But we as parents and as adults have to understand that they're in a space where physiologically, I mean, their brains are, are developing. They are not fully developed as ours are. And so part of that, um, part of that space that allows them that prefrontal cortex place that allows them to make certain decisions or can help them inhibiting certain responses is not fully developed. And we as parents need to remember that uh, that reflection time uh, so that they can apologize or can have a, a think about the way that they behaved in the moment is something that comes much less easily to them than it, than it does to us. Um, Tom and Hannah, are you okay to fast forward now to the second part of the scene? Um, and this is around the issue of Hannah wanting to see her friends, you having to explain the, the lockdown rules, you know, and your interpretation of the lockdown rules in her eyes, um, uh, I thought was very interesting um, because she actually got quite a sharp reaction from you at, at one point. Um, do you want to have, a, have a, a, a look at that? And again, audience members, please say stop when you feel that uh, the uh, situation is kind of getting it off, off track. Can I meet my friends on Saturday? No, you know you can't. We'll be meeting outside and we'll be socially distanced. Please, I haven't seen them since before Christmas. Well, I'm not sure you should have seen them then either. But you let me go then, so what's the difference? Come on, you know the rules are getting tighter. But we'll be really careful. All my other friends are allowed to go out. Their parents trust them to be sensible. <laughs> yeah, well, it's best not to put it in those terms after we found that vape in your room. I told you that it wasn't mine. I was holding it for a friend. Do you even know how ridiculous that sounds? Why can't you just let me see my friends? It's really important to me. Yeah, so it's not killing everyone by okay, spreading stop. the virus. Thank you very much. Um, OK, we've had a stop there from the audience. That seemed to rock it, didn't it? <laughs> Which was uh, almost out of nowhere. At what point, um, Tom, did you think that it began to escalate in your eyes? What made you take a sharper tone? Um, I think it was, you know, it was pretty much straight away because this is, for me, it's it's pushing pushing at a door that uh, you know that is, is already closed. You know, we've we've had the discussion around this lots of times, and I'm, and I know that it's you know it's difficult for for Hannah not to see her friends. I, I, I do realise that, but you know, at the same time, we're we're all having to be uh, compromised in, in what we do. And it's just the sort of constant asking and constant pushing at the door when I've said no so many times. So I think it's the repetition of that that immediately I just go straight up to 90 with it. Yeah, Holly and, and as Chardy, I guess that this is quite common that teenagers and, and even little children will push boundaries, won't they, all the time and, and that parents find it annoying because they've said no once. So how do you resolve this? It's really hard. It's really exhausting and it's really hard to um, resolve these kinds of things because again, um, there's so much pushback at the moment and there's so much frustration on, on the parts of our teen kids. They, they really are struggling and <clears throat> they need this more than anything. They really do need the social outlet. They really do need to connect with their friends and it's, um, it's very hard to know how to navigate this as parents as well. I think <clears throat> one thing that would probably help is when Tom said, when you were talking to, to us, Tom, you were saying, I know how difficult it is for her. 
And that didn't really come across in, in your attitude or your conversation with Hannah. So I think that kind of, you know, the, the, the lack of empathy, I think if you'd said, look, I know this is just a nightmare for you, Hannah, but you know, I don't make the rules, the government makes the rules and the rules are what they are and I'm really sorry. And, you know, um, if we could find another way, I'd, I'd, you know, try and help you. But, but right now I can't think of anything else. I think that's, that would help. Um, and I think the other thing is that, you know, um, you know, when there are certain rules and you agree on certain things and you've already spoken about why certain things are, um, I don't think it's very helpful to rediscuss the why. So, you know, I would suggest something like that we call nonviolent resistance with, with like teenagers is, is, is quite helpful because you just say, well, I've already discussed it, you know why, so I'm really sorry, but you can't, rather than get into another conversation about, well, you know, and your vape and your friends and blah, 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 because um, things escalate quite quickly with teenagers and you don't really win those conversations because teenagers have a um, hundred times more energy than we do and they can go on for days <laughs> with different arguments and we run out of arguments and then it just becomes quite nasty. So I think, you know, holding a firm stance once you, decide no on something you explain it once or twice and the you know the teenager knows why and you just say I'm really sorry I wish I could do something else but I've given you my reasons you know why you can't meet your friends and I'm really sorry and just stick with that I'm really sorry but, but no I'm really sorry no and you know at some point the teenager kind of gives up and I think that's the no isn't always the hardest bit it's the consistency with the no isn't it Jeff? exactly exactly so they, you know, this idea of the hope is that you're, they're going to wear you down and you're going to be, cha you're going to change your mind. That's, yeah. what, that's what they should be doing, right? As that's what they should be doing. Yeah. That's what they should be. Cause that's exactly what that pushing that boundary is. And in other times and in better times, perhaps it's easier to hold that boundary. But right now our boundaries as parents and as adults are also you know, we're also wanting to push those. We're also wanting to say we have absolutely had enough. So let's forget it all. Right. But we know that we can't do that because we're the we're the grown ups in this. We're the ones who have to make those rules and um, to just ensure that you have a, have an opportunity to um, release that your own frustration around it so that you can come back to being firm with your nose with your teens. And I think you can say you're frustrated. To the teenager i think you can say by gosh you know if i could i'd let you go out and to a the biggest party ever you know i feel so frustrated about this for you yeah. i feel it for me i think that would help as well you're right holly yeah, yeah. and uh, one of our audience members has made exactly that point stephanie says i find it hard to maintain positivity and patience with my kids because i myself am exhausted and frustrated and uh, although obviously teenagers do tend to look at things from their own world, actually parents are absolutely fed up. Parents can't go and see their friends. Parents are having to work remotely while there are all the distractions going on in the house. Parents still have to fulfill their responsibilities as parents and as employees. Mm. Um, Charlotte said here, due to the ever-changing government advice, I am seen as the bad guy and I am the one associated with ever-changing rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so hard. That's yeah. a reality. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's carry on if that's all right, Tom and Hannah. So Tom, could you take a tiny step and think to yourself something Shardy suggested uh, was she said, you know, if I could find another way to help you, I would. Can you include that in the scene now and see what kind of reaction you get from Hannah when you kind of turn your tone really. Sure. Can I meet my friends on Saturday? Look, uh, you, you know we've discussed this and, and the answer is no. But We'll be careful and we'll be socially distanced. Look, I, I know it's not, I'm not questioning how responsible you be. And I, I, I am sorry, you know, I, I do get it. I know it's frustrating. You want to see your friends and, you know, if it was, if it was down to me, then I, yeah, but you know, you know what the, the government guidelines are at the moment. But even if I saw one of my friends, I went for a walk with them, distance, like we wouldn't touch each other at all. Yeah, look, I, I understand that. Look, you, you're just not hearing me. Look, it's, it's the same for me as well. Look, I can't go and see my friends either, so I don't see why it's any different for you, all right? It's, it's a nightmare. 
but I'm used to seeing my friends every single day at school and yeah. now I'm ex expected to just not see them at all yeah and, I, and I'm used to going to work every day and seeing my friends there and my colleagues there and I'm not okay we all have to it's not the it same for bit. you though yes it is actually it is but you don't seem to realize that you just think the world is revolving around you that's it that's stop the there if you don't mind, please, thank you very much. We've got to stop. We've got to stop with uh, lots at that point. Um, Tom was explaining his point of view, wasn't he? And saying, you know, I'm in it just as much as, as you're in it. Uh, the audience member here is saying the parent should be the one. All right, and look, this is, I, I, I'm, I'm frustrated by it too as well. All right, so let's just, let's just maybe part this for now. All right, I've said no, and you know, you, we just have to say that it's frustrating for both of us. All right, but it is really hard not seeing them every single day. I feel yeah. like I can't even talk to them because the FaceTime is just doesn't feel like a proper conversation. Yeah, I know. All right, sorry, the answer's no. Okay, thank you. Um, Holly Shardy, do you think that was a better interaction? Did it resolve anything? Can you ever resolve anything in one interaction? Well, I mean, I think sometimes, you know, there is no resolving. It's, it's just the, the, the parents sticking by their decision and, and you know, kind of just, just sticking with the no. And of course, what, what happened here is you know, Hannah gets the clear message that um, that it's not going to go any further, that there's a no, but there's no escalation, if you wish, and there's no argument. Um, and, and it is what it is, you know, there's a, there's a no, they've discussed it before, and so dad stays calm and just says a firm no, with, with empathy this time, I feel. Holly, your thoughts? I think, I think he did a better job of that. Definitely. And he stopped himself when he felt that it was, he was getting more irritated and he said, can we just park this? Hannah kept going as she would do and, and he held his ground. So I think, uh, I think that was a good job. Okay. That's lovely. All right. Let's uh, carry on with the scene and let's just see now whether you can persuade Hannah to come down for supper and how you're going to persuade her to come down for supper. Um, so look, that's you know, I'm afraid that's a, that's a no on that one. Um, it's be nice if we uh, if we saw you uh, at dinner this evening. I don't know yet. All right, what uh, what 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 might make the difference? If I could see my friends. Look. <clears throat> We, we were good. We could have you down at dinner, all right. Yeah, your, your mum doesn't feels like you're never down here. We need to be eating as a family. That's something that, that we should be doing, and it's not happening, all right. So, do you think you could just maybe make the effort to get downstairs? But I mean, it's just going to be the same where we sit down. We don't have a conversation about anything because there's nothing to talk about. Yeah, well, it's not for the want of trying, all right. We we do make an effort. I just don't see the same coming back from you. But it's just the same thing every single day. 
Okay, morning. let's just let's just stop it there. Um, just an apology to the audience. We lost the feed for a few minutes. So, in summary, what we were doing was watching Tom and Hannah uh, play the scene again, but with Tom being uh, more open in terms of uh, questions he was asking Hannah and uh, less conflictual with her um, and more accepting. But as we've gone on, if you saw this, this last couple of minutes there, it did feel as though it was gonna escalate. Um, Holly and Shadi, Hannah's attitude, yeah, I'll come down to dinner if, is that very typical teenager behavior, that bargaining? Of course, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Just negotiating, seeing what she can get. Maybe I'll think about it, but I, I'm going to make you pay in some way, right? Yeah. And, and how does that make parents feel when teenagers do that? Because if it's quite common for them to do that, how can teenagers get out of that, uh, parents get out of that deadlock without getting increasingly frustrated and annoyed? Well, I would say um, use of, uh, of humour helps a lot. So, you know, having a little laugh and saying, gosh, I know, I know where you're going with this, but, you know, I wish I could give in and say, yes, you can see your friends so that I could see you. Um, but, you know, I can't. Is there anything else that um, I can do to make it easier? And dad does ask, how could we make it easier or how could we make it better? But I think, you know, what, what dad is saying essentially is uh, your mum and I miss you. You know, we really miss you. We miss your presence. We miss being around you. And we know that I think that would be more helpful to say. And, and you probably think you've got an overload of us and you want to see less of us, but, <laughs> but we miss you. It'd be great to see you, even if it is for a short while, I think would be a bit more helpful to say. But use of sense of humor is, is, is always, it always works with teenagers, usually, not always. Nothing um, always works with teenagers, but. <laughs> a comment here from the audience from Esme. Um, while dad is getting the words right, the words are better now, uh, your tone needs to improve and you need to be more positive. Is that, Tom, is that a fair comment? Yeah, look, it is. I, 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 I you know, I, I, I don't deny that. I can, I can hear it in myself and it's, you know, it's, it's really hard to put the brakes on sometimes. I, I you know, I, I absolutely recognise that. It's, it just seems to happen so quickly and so automatically. It'd be great if you could name that, Tom. Be great if you, you know, when you recognise that, be great if you could say, gosh, I sound, I hear myself talking. I'm so aggressive at the moment. I'm really sorry. I don't know what's going on, but I just feel this irritation. Let me just calm down a bit, you know. Um, we have some teenagers I know who, who've joined us. So let's ask from Hannah's perspective, what would make you change your attitude? What would dad have to do to make you think, even consider coming down for supper? Well... I suppose telling me why he wants me to come down and you know instead of just dinner he could maybe give some interest into some things I like so you know he could say let's watch a tv show together or let's play a game or something like that not just coming down for dinner because to me it's just the same every single day it's not very fun or exciting yeah, uh, and Holly and Shadi, do, do you find that uh, that that is the miscommunication between parents? That they're not just saying "come down for dinner," which Hannah sees it as "just come down for dinner." That perhaps Tom should be saying "come down for dinner." We're going to play a ball game or whatever. You know, we're going to um, play some video games. That that would make it more inviting for her and for other teenagers. Definitely, I mean anything right now that's a little bit different from what Hannah's saying, which is it's the same thing every single day. We're all feeling that. So if we can, you know, try to be a little bit more creative there and say, why don't you help me come, you know, why don't you come down and maybe you can help with dinner or, you know, you can think of something great for, um, for pudding or, you know, just something so that a Hannah's engaged a little bit too. And it's not, she's not just being prepared for, but she's involved in the process of it too. And that process could be a fun process as well if, if both are willing to be a little bit more creative maybe. Sure, and another question here from the audience um, from Sam. My wife and I feel like we're walking on eggshells around the house, which like Tom affects our tone. Um, how can you be more positive? And it can't be nice either for parents, can it to be 
tiptoeing around their teenage children? Yes. It's difficult to answer that question because we don't know why they're tiptoeing around. But one thing you shouldn't do is tiptoe around your teenage children because that's not helpful to them. It makes them feel very powerful. And no teenage child wants to feel that they are in charge. Uh, they want to feel that the parents are in charge or that the parents put boundaries in place and stick to the boundaries and can stand up to you when needed. So you need to be there to support and love and care, but you shouldn't be walking around on eggshells because that's just not healthy for the teenager. They don't act that way, right, Shadi? They're not acting as though they want, they, they want to give up that power. They're very much vying for it because that's mm. what they are developmentally but they need to know that in fact, you know, that power is not, um, is not really there because otherwise it's too frightening for them. So all exactly. of this is happening unconsciously. They're not aware necessarily of mm -hmm. uh, playing that out. Mm -hmm. oh, and Hannah, could you just try again? Let's, let's see if we can get a final push before we finish this webinar. So um, are you gonna make it down to dinner this evening? Maybe. Okay, what, 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 what could we do to ensure your presence? Um, maybe we could, you know that TV show that I just started watching? Mm -hmm. um, maybe we could watch that because I think you actually might enjoy it. The hospital one? Yeah. Okay. All right, are you going to start talking about operations and <laughs> blood? And... I don't know if it makes you uncomfortable, but I feel like you might like it because it's really interesting. Okay, all right. Well, I'm, I'm sure we can do that. Um, I was thinking of having a bit of a, a dessert-making competition. I, you, you're probably not interested in that, though, so best for you. No, that would and... actually be really nice. I don't want you, I tell you what, you stay upstairs and we'll, we'll, we'll do dessert amongst ourselves. Don't worry about it. No, no, no. That I'll, I'll, um... no, I'll come downstairs for that. Because I don't know, there's probably just going to be meringues or you know, trifle or something boring. <laughs> um, I'm sure we can sort something out. Okay, then, all right, okay. should we book you in? <laughs> okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Shadi and Holly, you were both smiling throughout that last interaction, uh, it, it worked better, and as you said earlier, a little bit of humor as well always helps. Yeah, yeah, it worked brilliantly. Yeah, yeah. well done. And you definitely saw your personality come through. It wasn't just you being humorous, but you saw that you both had that connection there. Hannah know, knew that you really, you know, you might have a problem with that show, but you showed that despite the fact you would definitely join her in on that. And that's got to have felt good for her. Okay. Um, we've got time for just a very quick couple of tips from Holly and from Shade, and then we'll um, end this webinar for today. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we've given tips all along, but I, I think, you know, one of the tips to give is, is don't talk at adolescence. I think in the second part of the, of the dialogue, I don't know if people remember, but Tom is talking at Hannah uh, rather than having a discussion with her. And that never works because the teenager then puts up a wall and just doesn't listen and, and gets very defensive. Um, and as we've said, you know, compromise and choose your battles. Um, don't say no to everything. Okay, Holly. I would say um, agreed with all of those points. Uh, and in addition, I think it's super important to take care of yourself as the parent along the way to ensure that all of these things that do build up um, have an outlet. And so there is a mom as well here in this situation. Use each other, your partners in this. So make sure that you talk to each other so that you can uh, come back to the table with Hannah, a, you know, a little bit more refreshed and knowing that you've had an outlet and an opportunity to vent your frustration. We're all human and we're all in this. So taking that time is very important. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Single, if you're a single pa parent, just talk to friends, close friends yeah. a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and that concludes the second episode of Consequentially Speaking, which we look at the perils of communication between parents and teens. Thank you to Tom, thank you to Hannah, thank you to Shadi and to Holly as well. Thank you to our audience who you've been brilliant at taking part and giving us your comments. The third webinar in our series takes place next month at uh, the same time on February the 25th. Keep an eye on our website and do send in your suggestions 
for topics, things that uh, you want to discuss. So that's on the SOAP website. Please do get in touch, email us with your thoughts, comments, and any topics you would like to discuss. Thank you very much.